the listeners, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure. Welcome to the Micro Podcast. I'm elated. I have two guests with me today, not just one, two this time around. Let me quickly start introducing them and then we get straight into the conversation. Uh, so, Chaitanya Conte, CK, he's a seasoned cybersecurity mentor who believes in simplifying things. He's the co-founder and the chief operating officer at Risk Quotient. Have a look here at cool logo on his t-shirt, where he mentors a team to provide innovative and practical cybersecurity advice. CK has over 17 years of experience in cybersecurity. He's also a coveted trainer for cybersecurity, as well as a featured writer in publications such as the CISO magazine. Then over to Andreas. Uh, Andreas Zell, he's based in Singapore, as I am. He runs his own actuarial boutique uh, firm here, and he's been a guest on the, pod, the podcast before. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Hey, thank you nice thank you for to having be here, Rachel. And thanks for taking the time on this afternoon. So we're going to talk today about one of the hottest topics. Um, we've chosen cyber. And what we're going to do is we'll give our, I have to say, my guests spin on cyber to be a bit more precisely for a few minutes. And then I'm most eager actually to hear from them what their value proposition, how they look at cyber and what, what, what you guys actually can help companies in, in assessing and managing cyber risk. So take it away. Give us your spin what cyber is. Over to you. OK, uh, thank you for that, Rito. And thank you for the quick introductions. I'll, I'll go first and then Andreas can probably pitch in wherever he feels there are things that can be uh, added to it. So uh, we've heard the word cyber very often and cyber is like I think we were just discussing before the podcast. It's, it's been a word which is overused and done to death. But cyber risks are existing and uh, the concern that I have or the points that I would like to put across is that when you talk about a cyber incident, it is not just breach that causes a cyber incident. You know, cyber incidents come from outages, they come from errors, configuration errors, go live errors. You know, there are so many things that cause a cyber risk to materialize that our perception of a cyber incident being just a breach, you know, some hacker sitting somewhere in some corner trying to get into our system is, is sort of very one dimensional. And that's the point I would like to make that cyber is probably more than that one dimension. It is it has multiple dimensions and every cyber risk professional should look at a cyber risk in that manner. I think that's very comprehensive. Just one thing to add. The, <clears throat> the scary thing about cyber risk is sometimes you, you don't know that you've got a cyber loss or a cyber attack. Yes, that's all I have to add. Absolutely, well, absolutely. What I, in a way, find fascinating and scaring about is there's always a human factor to it, right? You can have your your hardware, software systems, and so on and so forth, up to the latest and the greatest, and then you have one person pressing the wrong button or answering the wrong the wrong question on the call, and then and, and you're in for it. Yeah. So, following up on that, so who, who's who's exposed to cyber? Who's facing it? Well, I, I would say anybody who has a cyber setup, right? Any, anybody who has anything to do with the cyber world does have potentially some level of risk. And while, while that is a very broad definition, I would say that uh, it's more critical to organizations and people who have a lot of data and information uh, that can be considered of value to others. So, uh, when you're talking about cyber breaches in terms of an attack from outside, you're more vulnerable to those attacks or you're more uh, targeted to these attacks when you have the data and information that others seek. So while I would say anybody who uses a computer, you, me, Andreas, anyone, would be vulnerable to a cyber risk, it is handles with this large kind of data who has to really put in his money and his controls to make sure that the cyber risks don't materialize. So if, if I put myself into sort of my own shoes as the owner or the managing director of a small consulting firm, where, where do you think my exposure sits? Oh, yes, that's a very good question, Vito. Uh, as, as an owner of a small consulting firm, you will have to worry about two or three things, which are the core things that you have under your position. 
one of them would be your client confidential data. And if that client confidential data reaches in the wrong hands, you know, or it inadvertently gets exposed, you have some consequences, which could either be legal consequences, it could be consequences related to contracts, you know, your contracts may get terminated, which will result in future losses, right? So that's one aspect you have to really, really guard. And how you protect that is going to be your first step in cyber risk mitigation. And that's a cyber risk that you have to worry about. And if you buy cyber insurance, that's one of the things you might want to see if it is covered. The, the other aspect is obviously your presence on social media, because uh, the typical thing about small term boutique firms is that their reputation depends on maybe one or two key people. And if anything should happen to the reputation of these two key people, it becomes, you know, it, it's, it's a downward slide from there. So protecting your online reputation becomes a very big concern for you. So if you ask me as, as, as a professional opinion, I'd probably give you these two large areas to worry about, protecting your customer confidential data and protecting your reputation online. And these two cyber risks would be uh, apt for you to consider. Obviously, uh, giving, giving the consultant's uh, disclaimer that without knowing more information, I can't give you more advice. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. So Andreas, since you're in a similar situation as I am, are you, are you cyber protected? <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm the chief data protection officer of my company. So am I. <laughs> and <laughs> and I'm looking into I'm lo I'm looking into cyber risk. I'm currently not I haven't bought cyber insurance yet, but I'm very very cognizant of of the exposures. Yes. Nice summary, by the way, CK. <laughs> yeah. So, so since sort of picked up insurance as, as a risk mitigant. Um, can you guys give us an overview of what, what's actually available? Famous protection gap conversation we have for other lines of business. Okay, uh, I'll take that one. Um, you buy cyber insurance partially because of the cover that you get, but you also buy it because of the services that come along with cyber insurance it's a bit like like kidnap and ransom insurance you partially buy it because of the the compensation you get but you also buy it because of the additional services that you get like a, um, a hotline where they they will um well uh, where, where they will engage a security firm and and, and and try to 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 help freeing the hostage uh, that additional service is, is one of the reasons uh, companies buy by uh, kidnap and ransom insurance and it, it is a bit similar with cyber insurance. The services that come along with the policy are, in some cases, the reason the policy is purchased. Um, talking about the policy itself, um, a cyber policy usually um, provides compensation for financial loss caused by loss of data or by data manipulation or by data protection breaches. Um, the policy may cover also business interruption and third party loss, mainly legal expenses if you get sued. Right. Yes. So, and to add to that, um, when we talk about a cyber policy, uh, I would say there are three major components to what Andrea said. The first one is uh, data exfiltration, which means somebody stealing my data and the first party and third party consequences of that. The second one is business interruption, and which you probably get in a traditional insurance or some other insurance products, but they do have cyber exclusion clauses and you have to be careful about that. And uh, the third part is your third party liabilities, legal, regulatory, contractual obligations that will suddenly pile up on you should you uh, be found in breach of the cyber policies, the cyber security risks. You know, suddenly a GDPR applies, which is 4% of your global revenue, and you are possibly going to you know, go it's down. Significant money, yes. It's very significant yes. money. So, so listening to what, what the two of you just shared with us, there is ex ante or ex post service from, from, from the insurers, and there is a fairly wide range of, of um, coverage. So 
is it fair to say you would highly recommend that any business picks this up? So you're basically asking who should buy cyber? In other words, uh, yeah. <laughs> I would say um, the short answer is who doesn't want to self-insure. <laughs> However, it's it's actually not that simple because if you actually go through the cyber exposures that you've got in your organization, more often than ever, you would find that actually cyber, your cyber exposures are higher than you would have thought. Mm -hmm. So you should first try to understand the exposures that, you're, that you've got before you decide whether you want to self-insure or whether you want to buy insurance. Wow. Only, only after you're fully aware what exposures you actually have, uh, you should decide whether to buy insurance. Second um, part of my answer would be the additional services like a cyber um, helpline, a cyber risk hotline that sometimes comes together with the cyber policy. If you like that service, that would be one more deciding factor for you or for your organization. Right, right. So let's let's say you, you guys know I'm, I'm, I'm on the board of um, of an educational institution, right? So, so let's say we would want to go into that um, exposure tracking or, yeah, so what, what, how could we go about this? Okay, I think I can, I can answer that. And uh, let's take your example of uh, an educational firm. Now, the, the main thing to understand when you're talking about cyber is that it's not, a traditional asset-based risk that you're talking about, mm. nor is it a very traditional third party. Yeah. Right. It, it is uh, it is information which the educational institution is holding and it is protecting that information on behalf of someone else. So when if I'm a student of the educational institution, I trust that whatever information I have, my grades, my, my all the information, you know, my mm -hmm. background information, everything, is given to you in good faith and you're going to protect it as you would protect your own information. And the exposure of that information, should that information be leaked out? It could be as simple as being leaked out to, you know, uh, somebody who's trying to sell dormitory saying, okay, you're all students here, <laughs> send out an SMS blast saying, dormitories are available at a cheaper cost here. Yeah. That is also a leak of my personal information. Right. No, I, no. It may be good for me or not, but it is a leak of my personal information. So that's one of the risks that the educational institution would be looking at, protecting yeah. the student yeah. information. Yeah. And if I have to buy cover for that, if I have to buy cover for protecting that information, I will have to look at what exposures I have, like Andreas said. Mm -hmm. Am I exposing myself to first party list? Probably not, because I losing that information, uh, unless it gets completely deleted, it's not a major risk for me, but I'm exposing myself to third party liability big time. Yeah. Reputational risk is there big time. So, and, and this is what you should consider when you are doing uh, these kind of assessments. I would prefer, and I would probably say that you should approach one of the professional services firms to give you a complete assessment of where you stand with respect to these risks. And then maybe Andreas can help you with choosing the right insurance for that. Right. Um, if I if I can if yeah, I Andres, take a ahead. bird's eye view, yeah. If I if I take a bird's eye view to to um, to your question, I would say um, the analysis should always be twofold. There should be um, a quantitative quantitative analysis, and but also a qualitative analysis. And the qualitative analysis is very much about risk governance, cyber risk governance, how the cyber risks are governed within that school, mm -hmm. um, because that will also drive the, the hard factors, the numbers. Right, right. But s since you mentioned the numbers, so, so and, and CK, you, you outlined one or two very, very tangible scenarios. Or well, let's maybe go back again to my firm. So if, if data leaks out, which shouldn't leak out, what, what, I'm, what I'm really struggling with is, and hopefully you guys can help me here, is what kind of value does that have? What, 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 how much insurance do I need to buy to be safe? How do we quantify this? Yes, so that's, that's a very, very good question. And uh, 
this is one of the questions which uh, many organizations have been dealing with and you'll find that you know a lot of these responses or a lot of people who answer these questions it's it's very vague and open but i would classify these risks into you know five or six types of uh, losses that you should really consider right so uh, for example the first one you would look at is an impact directly on your productivity now for your organization maybe productivity ham loss might not be as big because you probably will be able to get the information from somewhere but let's say there are 100 people who are sitting and waiting for something to happen and the system crash or they have been attacked by ransomware and you can no longer use them the productivity loss can be quite mm-hmm, large mm-hmm, right mm-hmm. there are other costs that you will have to have you'll have to have a response cost so uh it, let's say you're taking your backup which is on a cloud server and i hope you're taking your backup ridge it's, it's it's sitting on a cloud server and uh, there will be restoration cost for that backup how do you restore it and the time energy and the cost of spending that backup so it's it's basically a rest- restoration cost or a res- replacement cost you would put it there would be a response cost you will have to reach out to the people who have been affected in in the case of the education institution you might probably have to reach out to say uh, 300 uh, 3000 students and each of them will have to be probably given certain responses and some time allocated to how they are going to handle it so it's going to increase the effort and cost around that in fact uh, one of the examples which we normally speak about is uh when you talk about social security numbers in any country in in india we have the aadhar database or the pan database in the us is the social security number each of each country has its own social security number system should that information be leaked out just imagine the humongous cost of replacement you know just giving a new id to everybody is 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 probably going to bankrupt certain governments and yeah yeah that's, 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 I, I, i never thought about it that way that's gigantic yeah <laughs> <laughs> um yeah. can we can we get back to the sort of how to go about it in, in in a moment but there's just another thought that just hit me yes should i and can i as an individual actually buy cyber insurance <laughs> yeah that's that's very really realistic for the moment <laughs> <laughs> You, yes, you can so, actually. Uh, yes, CK, I'll let you reply. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I I was just saying, you know that uh, it it really depends upon what are the risks you per- perceive, right? And let's say social media is a risk you perceive, and mm. Peter being quite active and having a, a lot of podcasts and a lot of activity on social media, it makes sense to have a cyber insurance. Maybe who is someone more reticent and not very active, not as much probably. so it depends on the risk that you're looking at okay and we are actually um seeing initiatives in in the space of uh, personal cyber you seeing that in in southeast asia you see that in southeast asia oh cool yes we are seeing initiatives in this in this direction oh, that's great so it okay. it will be available okay okay it is or it will Sorry if um, I'm a bit picky here. Yeah, but I, 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 I make phone calls or not that. <laughs> in in India, we have uh, one insurer who's offering personal and individual cyber insurance cover. Right. Uh, typically, the the risk that they're going to they cover is financial losses due to online transactions. So you're buying something on Amazon and you get hacked into, and you can you know cover those losses. So that's one way to look at it. uh what they're not covering is your reputational risk the, the other risks that come along with it like when we were talking about losses for corporates the similar losses do come for individuals yeah. so yeah. let's say an an actor who has a big social so a big leak on social media mm-hmm. would probably not have a couple of films being signed up you know no income for a couple of years so those kind of reputational losses might be an impact people do definitely need to have these kind of covers Well, in in that in that environment also substantial amounts of money right so, yes yes absolutely absolutely yes okay let, let's maybe go back a bit to the more corporate com- company environment so um if a company or any organization has decided they have they have an exposure they probably even quantify to a certain extent so what do I, what do they need to do to get cyber covered reasonably quickly without filling up hundreds of pages and waiting for months and months and months what's your recommendation here 
Well, um, I recommend that that the organization organization um, really is able to demonstrate that they understand their own cyber risk and that they know their own cyber risk well. Either they have that knowledge in house and gone through that exercise in house, or they got some external help from a cyber risk consulting firm, mm -hmm. and then approach the insurer or the broker and really demonstrate they have done the work, they have identified the cyber risks, they have mitigated here and there or reduced the cyber risk here and there, govern, gov, they're governing the risk, they know it, they understand it, and they're governing it well. This should be the fastest way to, to actually um, get things done, to, to actually obtain cyber coverage. Mm -hmm. But would you? I think, think I can add yeah, to that. Go, go ahead, Sorry. go first. No, no, go first, yeah. please. I, I think I can add to that when Andrea says that they should be looking at, you know, a holistic understanding of themselves. So the, the, the best way to get get a loan from the bank is to prove to your banker that you do not need a loan. <laughs> if it applies inside. <laughs> <of you. laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. So if, if you can say that you have the governance model and you have everything in place, you're managing your risks and, you know, you have it in, you have a structure in place. Uh, you have compensating controls where there are certain risks you consider are high. And then in that case, you can very quickly approach an insurer and, and by looking at your data, uh, an insurer will very quickly be able to provide cyber insurance to you. Because today there is no standard way in, in which an organization is evaluated for cyber. Although we are working on that as was cautioned, but uh, currently there is no standard way which insurers evaluate cyber. So they have to look at each case to underwrite separately. And uh, this will make it much faster for them when you go prepared. Can I just pick up on something Andreas just said? Um, that sort of availability. Um, I mean, there's a lot of talk and writings about hard market and underwriting profits and so on and so forth. So is, is the market liquid out here for cyber? The take up, as far as I know, is the take up of cyber insurance, as far as I know, at least in this part of the world, is, is still rather low. But I might be wrong. Mm -hmm. You should ask this probably um, a specialty lines insurer, not mm -hmm. not a consultant. You should ask this question uh, an insurer. Um, well, if the take up is low, that kind of implies that there's capacity around, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not so sure because yeah. there aren't many there aren't many players actually providing um, cyber insurance. Everybody oh, provides okay. property insurance, but not many insurers uh, have entered cyber yet. So uh, I'm not sure whether there's actually more than enough capacity available. Again, that's a question for an insurer. They, they, could, they could tell you how much competition they are facing. Just triggered a thought in me. So I'll, I'll set up a startup insurer here and I focus on cyber, right? right if, if the I think is... there already are. I think there already are specific cyber focused underwriters and uh, I think insurers as well coming up. Right. But uh, I would just sort of make a hazard a guess here that there is a sort of skill gap in underwriting cyber and that le leads to the insurer mostly taking the treaty ro route to, uh, to, to underwrite insurance. And that reduces capacity because the insurer is not willing to put up his own mm -hmm. balance sheet. They'd mm -hmm. rather go to the RI. And that probably is what Andreas is referring, you know. So it might not directly be that less uptake means more capacity. Yeah, in, in some cases, indeed, the, the insurer entering cyber as a new line of business, they seek help from, they seek external help. And in some cases, that help is coming from one of the largest, from, from the largest uh, two or three reinsurers. Along with right. reinsurance capacity, they provide the know-how, the know-how transfer to help them set up this new line of business. And that's indeed one way to enter cyber. Second well, can way I, would can be... I just pick up on that one? So, sorry, Andreas. The, I mean, if I were an existing insurer, let's say here in Singapore, doesn't matter, and I would have my motor property, etc., portfolio, and I would want to go into cyber. What, what should I? <laughs> what, what's the strategy conversation here, or the SWOT conversation you would recommend we go through? Okay, you've got three choices. You either um, approach one of the largest reinsurers ask them for assistance. Second choice is you build up that know-how internally. 
by yourself. Third choice is you, you approach a consulting firm and the consulting firm will, will help you set up your cyber practice. Okay. A anything else I should think about? Well, there's a lot of things that, that need to be thought about. Um, if you're approaching um, a consultant to set up your cyber practice, you, you still need to think about reinsurance, of course. You still need to find, <clears throat> or you, you need your broker to, to help you find reinsurance cover. You, you still need to think about that, of course. But the, the other services that you would get from your reinsurer, the assistance to set up your own cyber practice, that service could also come from an external consultant. Okay, okay, get it, get it. Yes. So for an insurer to set up a cyber, uh, cyber insurance sort of product and run it successfully, they, they need three things, right? They need capacity, either their own or uh, borrowed capacity. They need the know-how you know, to be able to underwrite, to be able to proceed, and they need the ecosystem of servicing, the policy servicing piece. So if you're able to put these three pieces perfectly, then you will have a reasonably profitable business line on cyber. You can ride on the tails of your other products and have a reasonably profitable one. So many insurers today are have a bit of a concern, you know, that we do not know cyber. Cyber is very new. Uh, it, it can lead to a lot of, you know, the, the fear that it's it has multiple very high high catastrophic events and we don't know whether we'll be able to uh, service all of them. So all these concerns can really be eliminated if you figure out all the three buckets and give them the right thought. Obviously, the first part is to have build the know-how. Now, know-how can come from consulting firms like ours or it can come from hiring capacity in-house or it can come from taking an end-to-end -end package from your reinsurer saying, okay, I'm your reinsurer, I'm giving you capacity, here is the treaty, here is the software, do this and you can get money out of it. That's, it, it, it leaves you very little room to, you know, manipulate your books or, you know, I wouldn't say manipulate, but manage your own books. Whereas yeah. going on your own will have a lot of uh, freedom, a lot more, you, you can add a lot more variety, differentiate your product and you know, build it mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. a service that really makes sense. Yeah. Yes, and once you've started writing a few policies, you also need to think about accumulation, <laughs> aggregation of your cyber risk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Well, that's been extremely informative. Let me let me just see whether I sort of got this right. So we have cyber exposure that's ever evolving, right? So it's a bit difficult to grasp the exposure. It potentially affects everybody from from an individual to a micro price SME to the largest giga enterprises. Um, maybe as a next point, insurance is a ingredient of good cyber hygiene, right? Yes. But what I understand from the two of you, um, quantifications, self-assessments, and then actually also practicing insurance is maybe not as straightforward as it is for, for those lines of businesses that we know for dozens or even hundreds of years already, right? And, yes. And, and, and in those areas, it's well worth thinking about getting somebody in who has that specific knowledge, who has that domain knowledge and, and can help you to, to, to build your, your, your product and your service suite, right? Yes. Uh, just to give you an example, Rito, when Please. you're looking at data, right, you have uh, mortality tables in, in, in life insurance and, you know, they've been built for hundreds of years. And if I look at cyber and try to figure that data out, the largest database I can get of people reporting incidents is barely 10,000 records. And out of that, because it is mandatory in the U.S. to report things, you have about 7,000 records from the U.S., which is such a big skew that you can't really make much use of that data in, in quantification. And that's yeah. where people like Andreas come in and they step up with their models and give us a, you know, a much, much better way to model right. these risks. Okay, gentlemen, that has been very informative. I thank you very much for your time. Uh, please stay safe, wear the masks, keep the distances, and hopefully we have a chance anytime soon to speak again. Yes, uh, absolutely. Thanks. Thank you for having us, Rito.
It was a pleasure being here. A pleasure. Take care, guys. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.